guys, welcome to Digit.in and today I'm reviewing the Asus ROG GA35. This is the gaming desktop from the company. Uh, it's powered by an AMD processor. It's actually pretty amazing and very exciting that I've had the last few days with this machine. So there's a lot to go over. So before we get into all of that, make sure to hit the like and subscribe button on our channel. And there's also the bell icon that you should probably hit on so that you don't miss out any future videos from us. On that note, let's begin. So this is the ASUS ROG G35 gaming desktop. It's powered by an AMD processor. This is the AMD Ryzen 9 3950X. 16 cores, 32 threads, beast of a processor. Accompanying that is 16 gigs of RAM. There's a 512 GB NVMe drive. It's a PCI 3 NVMe drive, not PCI 4. More on that in a bit. Uh, there's a NVIDIA RTX 2080 Ti for graphics and of course there's also an additional 2TB storage hard drive um, for you so that you can store all of your games and all. So this is a high-end gaming desktop from ASUS and over the course of reviewing it I actually realized that while yes it is absolutely a beast when it comes to gaming it's actually better suited for creative professionals and because it can handle some very 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 heavy edit loads with absolute ease so we're going to get into that in a bit more on the specs part so the cpu is actually cooled by a uh, liquid cooler it's a 240 millimeter cooler which asus says has been designed in conjunction with cooler master um, other than that there is an 80 millimeter fan on the back to exhaust the heat and there's only a singular fan in the front which is designed to basically pull in cold air to cool this vertically mounted gpu so in terms of um, cooling you know it's it's a passively cooled system and initially it made me very skeptical of this configuration but I'm pleasantly surprised uh, the system does not overheat and we'll get into the specifics of that in the performance section overall there's uh, in addition to what's on the inside the specification wise there's also two slots in the front uh, for hot swappable ssds like if you have a two and a half inch ssd just sort of lying around you can put it in here and it becomes like a removable storage and surprisingly it's super convenient now you may be thinking who has a two and a half inch ssd just lying around right uh well if you're going to be buying this machine and given how much it costs you can probably afford one so basically that's covering all of the specs of the asus rog g35 gaming desktop now let's look at how it performs <laughs> This is actually one of the most exciting parts about having tested this G35. It's got a 16 core processor. And for me personally, I've never really had the chance to work with something this beastly. So it was very exciting. Of course, first we started off with our benchmark loads and you can see all of the numbers. And honestly, the benchmark numbers are pretty high and it's to be expected. There's nothing out of the ordinary here. Gaming, however, is where we found some very interesting results. Now, Every game that we tested, be Doom, Doom Eternal, Call of Duty Modern Warfare, Metro Exodus, Overwatch, all of the popular modern day titles, right? Everything runs really well, really fast. You, we had some very impressive frame rates, which you can see in the chart on your screen right now. But I want to take a minute to talk about the load on the CPU, the GPU, and of course, the corresponding thermals. Most of the games are put, putting the 2080 Ti in this machine to 100% of its capabilities. They're pushing that GPU and the usage sits at 100% as reported by Hardware Monitor. The CPU, on the other hand, has cores that are practically idling, which means that it almost feels like the 2080 Ti is the limiting factor in terms of the frame rates we're getting from this machine. Now, Doom Eternal, we're seeing north of about 200 FPS at the, uh, the ultra graphic settings. And once again, is the GPU that's maxed out, but the CPU still has a lot of headroom. The cores are still uh, available in order to, you know, push the frame rates higher if needed. Also, a lot of games are not designed to take advantage of this many cores, but given the fact that we have them, and given the fact that not all of the cores are even running at their 100%, it's somewhere in the comfortable 50-60% range, but the GPU is maxed out. So this leads us to believe that in the near future, if NVIDIA or AMD, whoever, was to release a GPU that was far more powerful than the 2080 Ti, you could get better frame rates with this 
processor installed. So you could just swap out the GPU and you'll get better performance. On that note, moving forward, where this combination actually really, really excels, and this is where you see all of the components really getting pushed to the limit, is in creative workloads. Now, when it comes to Adobe Premiere, Adobe Lightroom, and maybe even Photoshop to some extent, these three applications, After Effects as well, by the way, these creative workloads are able to utilize all of the cores on the AMD Ryzen 9 3950X and the, all of the memory available on the 2080 Ti to the max. So this machine, even though a gaming machine, is ideally suited for creators because, oh my God, the, num the pace at which it's able to do things is just absolutely phenomenal. Now, I want to talk about the times this machine takes to render out certain types of video projects, photos, etc. Now, in Premiere, we have a test project with a duration of 20 minutes. We rendered this 20 minute file in 4K using the H.265 codec, 1080p in the, again 265, and we repeat the process for 264 codecs as well. Then we repeat this whole thing for a five minute clip so that we have a better idea of short versus longer clips. Um, so for the 265 codec, a five minute file, the 4K export took about three minutes, six seconds. The 1080p export again took the same amount of time. And when we switched over to 264, it took three minutes and 19 seconds. Whereas the 1080p version took just two minutes and 58 seconds. Moving over to the longer 20 minute cut, uh, 4K X264 edit took 12 minutes, 28 seconds and uh, the 1080p version took 13 minutes and 34 seconds and is the same for the 264 numbers as well. So in about 13 minutes, this machine is able to push out a 20 minute export in either 4K or 1080p. For photo editors out there, if you're working with Adobe Lightroom, uh, we took 500 RAW files from a Nikon D800, massive RAW files, and then we do an export in batches of 100, 250 and 500 RAW files at the same time. The 100 minute raw file export took only 2 minutes 14 seconds. The 250 image raw files took 5 minutes 48 seconds. And a total of 500 raw files were exported in just 11 minutes and 22 seconds. Now, these are very, very impressive numbers. We've not seen export times this fast ever on, you know, machines. So it's really, really impressive. The other thing that was really notable was, especially with Lightroom and Premiere exports, they're actually utilizing the CPU to its max. In Lightroom, when we were exporting the 500 files, all cores were at 100%. And that's actually what you're paying for, right? If you're paying for a 16 core chip, you want all of that to be used in your heavy workloads. And that's sort of what was happening. And that's pretty amazing. Same thing with Premiere as well. Premiere Day was for exporting when you've got hardware uh, render enabled, it will use both the GPU and the CPU so that you know the encodes are shared and then you see the CPU usage jump up to 100% and your GPU usage sits around 40 to 50%. And that's normally how Adobe balances the workload. In all of this, in gaming, in uh, editing in Premiere, editing in Lightroom, editing in Photoshop, one thing that I wanted to really keep my eye on were the temperatures, because there's not a lot of cooling in here. There, there's no, there's no four fans on the front, two in the back. There's nothing. Like there's just, it's a very bare minimum setup when it comes to fans pulling in air and pushing out air. So I really wanted to see how this was going to impact the temperatures. The CPU surprisingly does not cross the 86 degree mark. And, so, and this we confirmed using hardware monitor, which is pretty impressive because if over a period of 11 minutes, if your CPU is completely maxed out while it's doing a heavy workload and it does not breach a certain temperature, it just speaks to the fact that the cooler that's been built is doing a job well. So overall, you're not going to have to worry about thermals. Uh, even the GPU stays at about 72, 73 degrees during gaming and uh, Premiere exports. Where it does cause some problem is in terms of the heat being exhausted. Now, I was testing this desktop uh, over a course of two days. I had no air conditioning in my room. And this thing really, really puts out a lot of heat. Uh, we noted at about 42 degrees, the air coming out of the PC is about 42 degrees in temperature. And that's quite a lot. So you are going to need an air conditioner in your room in order to make sure that, you know, the ambient temperatures stay at a cool, relatively cooler temperature so that 
over the period of time let's say if you're gaming for an entire day you don't see temps in your room and in the pc rising this does rely a lot on uh, ambient temperatures the cooling in this thing because there's really nothing else going on on the inside so there is that so what's really interesting is we talked about the temperatures in a room which had no air conditioning but if you do use this in a room which has an ac with the ambient temperature set to like 23 degrees or so we notice a massive difference in temperatures for example while rendering in premiere and lightroom the cpu temps are around 62 degrees celsius and the gpu temps are no higher than 49 degrees that's amazing that's literally almost like a 20 to 30 degree difference in the cpu and gpu so overall like this passive cooling thing works but it does rely on the fact that you need to have very very cool ambient temperatures so of course that is a big caveat here so the built-in design of this desktop is actually pretty novel because there's a lot of things going on that sort of work with the components on the inside for starters this CPU case, this cabinet is a dual chamber design. And by doing that, it has allowed ASUS to one, move the power supply into the back chamber, uh, also move the hard drive into the back chamber. So you have some heat generation that's been separated off from your main chamber. So your CPU cooler is actually mounted right above towards the center. So it's not actually pushing out any heat inwards. It's actually exhausting heat out. Um, the GPU, which is vertically uh, mounted, actually has a metal plate on top so it separates the cpu part of the motherboard from the gpu part so again effective cooling by separating the heat the other thing about this chassis is that it has a lot of cuts and holes and it's perforated lots and lots of openings so the case actually offers maximum airflow by you know sort of not obstructing any air there is a downside to that though the design is such that over a period of let's say one month or maybe even two months if you live in a place where there is dust like i do you're gonna have a hard time cleaning this machine in fact right now after testing this machine for a sum total of seven days i can already see dust on the inside and it's going to be a nightmare to clean the dust out of all of this zigzag edges and these sharp cut lines you're gonna have to take a brush and just sort of go at it so cleaning this machine is going to be definitely a problem the other really cool built-in design feature are these flaps that they have provided to keep your uh, hot swappable ssd base safe the power button that's integrated onto the front side is actually pretty neat as well and then there's of course uh, rgb strips all over the place so overall the built-in design of this machine is really nice one thing i do want to note is this top handle which you know you may think is more of a gimmick but it's actually not this cabinet in total weighs about 14 and a half kilograms and it's easy i was able to lift it up using the handle on multiple occasions carry it around the house you know we brought it in for shoot carried it with the handle put it up here doesn't feel like it's something that's going to break um how uh, asus has reinforced it as still has to be seen but uh, overall it feels pretty sturdy the asus rog strix ga35 also packs a whole bunch of ports let's go over the ports on the back first you have four USB 3.2 Gen 1 ports, which are of type A. You have three USB 3.2 Gen 2 type A ports. You have one USB 3.2 Gen 2 type C port. Also on the back, you'll find one HDMI 2.0 port alongside a display port, one RJ45 Ethernet jack, and of course, five audio jacks alongside one SPDIF port for digital audio. That's not all though. There's also IO on the front. On the front, you have two USB 3.2 Gen 1 Type-A ports, two USB 3.2 Gen 1 Type-C ports, one microphone in and one headphone out. Obviously, there's no Thunderbolt since this is not an Intel machine, but given how many ports this thing is packing, I'm pretty sure you're going to find your all of your needs met with ease. <laughs> So there is a case to be made for buying a pre-built desktop, even though it may cost you a little more than a system that you would assemble yourself. A couple of things that come into mind is like all of these unique designs you can get with a pre-built desktop. There is, of course, the peace of mind that all the components you've got will be, you know, compatible with each other. And then there's, of course, the warranty. 
if anything goes bad with this desktop, you can catch Asus and have them replace it or fix it, whatever. But if you have a custom built machine, you'll have to find out who to go to, where the service center is, etc. all of that. It is a headache. As somebody who's been dealing with PC, pre-built PCs and custom built PCs for a long time, the headache of custom built PCs is always going to be there, in, you know, when you're assembling it, of course, that that's the biggest concern. No matter how many times you build a PC, there's some of us will always be worried about doing something wrong. So pre-built systems have their advantages, no doubt. But having said all of this, with the G35, there are some notable caveats and this machine is not cheap. So here are some things that I feel that work against the G35. For one, there are no dust filters, neither in the front, neither on top. Even if there are no intake fans in the front or top, the fact is without dust filters, this still does getting into the PC. Over the course of testing this for seven days, I can already see dust on the inside. Dust filters would have been nice. Second thing is, if you live in a part which is warmer than the usual places, let's say if you live in a desert or in you know near the equator, whatever, the problem is, you may find your temperatures higher than what we observed. Maybe you don't have an AC in your room to keep the ambient temperatures cool and you feel, okay, you know what? I wish I could add more fans to it so that it'll stay cooler, but unfortunately you can't. There is no way to mount any more fans to the front. There are no grills on the inside and same thing with the back fan. It's an 80 millimeter fan, which you cannot upgrade to a 120 or 140 because there are no mounting holes and if you go the DIY route where you think you know what maybe I'll just drill them uh, then warranty is gone so in terms of improving airflow there is nothing more you can actually do except just maybe make sure that the vents are in an open place and you have an AC in your room and I think that is asking for a lot Trusting this uh, setup is, well, for us, it's okay because we have air-conditioned rooms, we can uh, monitor the temperatures, we can sort of tweak these things around. But overall, not having the flexibility of being able to add more fans or upgrade the existing fans to bigger fans is sort of problematic. The third thing that caught me off guard was realizing that on the inside, the 16 gigs of RAM is actually a single stick. It's not even an 8 into 2 stick. So single channel on a performance gaming desktop really asus really not even like it, this is just pc building 101 dual channel ram always but you get one single stick and then you know even if you're trying to give us the logic that maybe you know people will want to upgrade later that's just no that doesn't work it should always be dual channel so that's one thing but perhaps the most surprising factor here is that the NVMe drive is a PCI 3 NVMe drive, not PCI 4. And everybody knows one of the best things about the new AMD platform is PCI 4. So the company says that they've, because of this whole COVID situation, there's been issues with procuring uh, units of enough PCI 4 NVMe drives, and that's why they had to ship it with PCI 3. But, you know, it's just, it's sad. It's It really is sad that you don't get PCI 4 with a machine that's this beastly. And personally, I feel that a 512 uh, NVMe is on the lower side when you consider the fact that you can get laptops with, uh, with a one terabyte NVMe drive for less than this. Like you can right now, if you just pick up, there's enough of them out in the market. So they could have done with a one terabyte NVMe. Overall, besides all of these drawbacks, I mean, there is there are quite a few of them for you to consider. And at the end of the day, the choice to whether buy this or not will depend on you. Here is my recommendation though. For gamers, the 3950X is like absolute overkill right now. But it is also a system that is completely future-proofed because if we've learned anything from AMD, it's the fact that they like to make their products as long-lasting as possible. Like look at the AM4 socket, you know, they're supporting it even now four years and three years into the future. So you know that the 3950X will take care of any of your needs well into the next three or four years without any problem. The GPU, of course, you can upgrade whenever a new one comes out. And if let's say the NVIDIA uh, RTX 30 series is more powerful than the 2080 Ti, they have a card, you can put that in there, get better frame rates. But what really this machine excels at is for creators, like it just cuts through Premiere like that. Like Adobe Lightroom is not an issue at all. And that's sort of, 
you know, we struggle with every minute of render time, crash renders, or, you know, having to scrub footage and wait a second for the effect to show up, uh, applying an effect and waiting for it to render first. None of that is an issue on this machine. And that's really the kind of audience who would benefit from something like this. And of course, it looks really cool too. So, you know, there is that. So when we reviewed the ASUS ROG Strix GA35 desktop, the video was actually shot at a point where we were not aware of the prices. We finally know how much this desktop costs and it's a price tag of 3,49,990. That's a lot of money, but hold on. Yes, you could maybe build this configuration for a lot less, but look at it this way. The CPU alone costs about 70,000 bucks. The GPU is over a lakh of rupees and you've got this really amazingly well-designed chassis that's not just about airflow, but also about, you know, the uh, hot swappable SSDs, the dual chamber design, the idea that a chassis could cool the internals passively. So all of that taken into account and the engineering and the quality of the overall build is pretty solid. So you do see why the company is charging a lot of money. Plus, let's not forget about the fact that there's import duties and taxes to be factored in as well. So yes, 3,49,990, a pretty steep price tag. But if you were to build this on your own, you wouldn't be way off the mark either. You would probably end up spending close to two and a half, quarter to three lakh rupees any which ways. So overall, in terms of its pricing, yes, you are paying an ROG premium, no doubt about it. But at the end of the day, what you also do get is an ROG machine. So overall, that's our review of the ASUS Strix G35 gaming desktop. It's a pretty amazing machine. It has definitely got its notable drawbacks. And that's why we're going to leave the decision to buy it or not up to you. Maybe you could wait. Maybe the PCI 4 comes out in a few months. You never know. But overall, it's an impressive machine. It works very well. Its performance is absolutely in the top tier. And overall, we're pretty impressed with it. Thank you guys for watching this video. And make sure to subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon so that you don't miss any future updates from us. Thank you and I'll see you in the next one.